In this video, we're going to explore the kingdom fungi. Now remember, this kingdom is in domain eukarya, so our fungi are going to have eukaryotic cells. They have a membrane-bound nucleus, they have organelles, and we're going to learn a little bit, not too much, but a little bit about the cellular structure of fungi. So this video is just going to do kind of an introduction to fungi and how we as humans use them, how they're important in the ecosystem, and just the incredibly important roles that they fill in our society. So thinking about their evolution, we're not going to dive into it too much, mainly because the leading hypothesis now is that there was many different evolutionary events that led to the rise of fungi. And what I mean by that is that there wasn't any particular common ancestor to some protists that led to all of the fungi. When talking about protists, we talked about the common ancestor with the carophytes that led to our land plants, but with fungi, we really don't have that analogy. Instead, what we think is there's multiple taxa or multiple common ancestors that gave rise to different groups of fungi. So we're not going to explore it much, but just know it's likely not one evolutionary event. Now, despite the stationary nature of fungi, it sometimes gets the, I guess, reputation or initial thoughts of it, oh, they're like plants, but that's couldn't be further from the truth. Fungi are a lot more closely related to animals. And the main reason for that is because like animals, fungi are heterotrophic. They do not have chloroplasts or chlorophyll. They have no way of using light energy. They, like us, have to consume other organisms in order to get the energy that they need for all of their cellular processes. However, they do differ from our typical animals in how they are getting um, their nutrition. So if you think about animals, I'll just use humans, we ingest our food and then internally our bodies digest it and get the different nutrients, vitamins, and um, sugars, proteins, etc. that we need. But fungi do it differently. Instead, what fungi do is they digest first and then ingest. And so what I mean by that, I'm going to tie in that bullet point underneath of it. So let's say that we have these fungi that are on this log. And we're going to talk about the structure of fungi here in a second, but they have these fibers called hyphae. And they they look like roots. They're not roots, but they look like roots. And so these hyphae are in and out of this log. And what they do is if you think about humans, we have stomach acid and the stomach acid breaks down um, all of our different food items. Fungi do the same thing, but they release those enzymes out of those hyphae. So for humans, it would be as if we puked up our stomach acid to break down our food that's sitting in front of us. That's what fungi do. They release these enzymes to break down the food that they're essentially sitting on. Then what these hyphae do, similar to roots, is that as that stuff is breaking down, the hyphae are going to absorb the nutrients, the sugars, all the things that that fungi needs. Now, that particular fungus isn't going to need everything, right? It's breaking down all that wood, but it might only need certain nutrients at any given time. Those rest of those nutrients, though, are now more readily available, right? It's not stuck in wood or in cellulose. It's now been broken down into smaller micro or macro molecules. So this is why fungi play an important role in decomposition, is because, yes, they are breaking down that log, which very few organisms, it's pretty much just fungi that can break down wood material. Yes, they're breaking it down for their own nutrition, but they don't 100% use all of it. A lot of it is just unneeded by the fungi, but is then returned um, into the soil then. Uh, it still goes somewhere, and so it serves as a very incredibly important decomposer. So I mentioned on the last slide, I kept saying these hyphae. So fungi are really cool. They're actually made up 100% of these thin filaments called hyphae. And you've probably seen hyphae before. If you've ever dug in the dirt and you see like all these white strands, you might have thought that they were roots, but they weren't. They were something called hyphae. And these thin filaments is essentially what makes up the fungal body, both below ground and above ground. If you look at this picture, we'll describe some of the things in this picture more in a second. 
is that you see above ground, these hyphae are just a lot more densely packed, so they can create a more 3D rigid structure. Whereas underground, these hyphae still exist, but a lot more sparse, a lot more spread out. It's not like an actual solid body that's underground. Now the hyphae that are found underground, we refer to that as the mycelium or the mycelia. It just depends if you're doing singular or plural. And so when I say underground, it could be like physically underground. That could be the hyphae that are inside the log or inside the bread. Typically we refer to the mycelia as just the hyphae that are inside a substrate, whatever that substrate is. These hyphae are haploid, and when we talk about life cycles, I'll re-emphasize that and talk about how that happens and whatnot. But just for now, know that the mycelia, or the hyphae underground, are haploid. And above ground, the fungi that you and I would typically see if we're walking through a forest, this is the hyphae that's above ground. This is the reproductive structure. This reproductive structure is essentially how we're going to give rise to more uh, fungi. And again, we'll explore that more in our life cycles. This reproductive structure is also diploid. And again, we'll explore that more uh, when we talk about life cycles. So let's talk about some of the importance that fungi have like in our lives, not just you and me, but also just the ecosystem in general. So not only are they incredibly important decomposers, but they form a lot of mutualistic relationships with other organisms. They actually form a really close relationship with land plants. So we use this term mycorrhizae. It's not a particular species, but we refer to mycorrhizae as fungi that are in a mutualistic relationship with plants. So very broad. It can be multiple species of fungi, multiple species of plants. We're really just talking about mycorrhizae as any fungi in any relationship with any plant. And what will happen is that these fungi uh, are usually growing in close association with plant roots. And what happens is the fungi, remember, they are uh, releasing enzymes into the surrounding environment. They're going to break down large, complex macromolecules into smaller molecules. That fungi will uptake the molecules they need, but they don't need all of it. So you can imagine plants that are growing right where fungi are, are greatly benefiting because the plants have an easy, accessible access to nutrients that the fungi just aren't using. And the fungi, again, are not going to use 100% of it. The plants now have a more readily available nutrient versus the plant and other natural processes slowly breaking down those macromolecules and slowly be able to absorb them. So that's how our plants are benefiting. Now our fungi are benefiting because with most plants, maybe all of them, but I hate to use the word all, most plants are also storing large macromolecules in their roots. So plants use their roots for a lot of different reasons, one of them being storage of extra, uh, particularly of sugars. Now, a lot of fungi, we're not going to go into the particulars, but a lot of fungi can actually tap into the plant roots and get these sugars. Now you might think that's negative, but again, this is extra storage. It, those sugars are down there because those plants weren't actively using it. And so the fungi is also getting an extra food source um, as needed. So nice benefit for both of them. Now this relationship is so strong and so helpful, particularly for plants, about 80 to 90% of plants on earth have a relationship with fungi, have mycorrhizae fungus that is associated with its plant roots. They really need each other. And while we won't explore this more in class, it's actually hypothesized that the only reason plants were able to colonize on land was because of fungi, that they needed this relationship in order to be able to get all the nutrients that they needed. This picture also kind of shows you that benefit of these mycorrhizal fungi and how having this fungi is really affecting plant growth. Another mutualism are lichen. So you've seen lichen before. If you've ever looked at a tree or a rock or a fallen log, you've probably seen maybe a bluish, maybe a greenish, sometimes an orangish stuff. Um, how it looks is really dependent. It could be crusty, it could be leafy, it could be a lot of different things. And it's a lichen. But lichens aren't an organism itself. Lichens 
is a mutualistic relationship between a fungus and either a cyanobacteria or a green algae. So a cyanobacteria would be from domain uh, bacteria, so it is a prokaryote, whereas green algae would be from domain eukarya kingdom uh, protista or protists. So even though you're like, okay, so it could be either bacteria or a eukaryote, yes, but both of them are photosynthetic, right? Cyanobacteria does photosynthesis. Green algae does photosynthesis. And so this diagram on the right-hand side kind of shows you what this association looks like. So here at the bottom, this would be the tree. So this is the tree trunk. Then you see the fungi, which are this kind of orangey, yellowish color, is kind of attaching to that tree trunk. And it's on the inside of that tree trunk, and it's also on the outside. So when you're looking at a lichen, you're looking at the fungi part. Inside, so kind of squashed and layered in between, this picture is showing algal cells, it could be again cyanobacteria, that are kind of in between. And you can see the fungi kind of going all in between all of them. Now, despite the fact that these are different organisms, the relationship is still similar. Fungi are able to get a lot more nutrients available to these photosynthesizers, and these photosynthesizers are creating molecules that those fungi can use. So it's still the same or similar to mycorrhizae. It's just looking at different photosynthesis, different photosynthesizers outside of land plants. And while all these things seem really cool, um, I mean, fungi, just like other things, don't only have positives. There are a lot of fungal parasites that are around. I'm going to focus on kind of the, the human direct ones, but there's a lot of fungal parasites across all kingdoms of life, some of which have had really detrimental effects to the populations they infect. So thinking about humans, we get fungal infections. So this picture is of athlete's foot. Uh, other examples would be a yeast infection or diaper rash. <clears throat> and essentially where that irritation is coming from is from that fungi is chilling on your toes and this hyphae are growing and it's releasing enzymes because that's how it gets its nutrition, except it's releasing enzymes on your body. <laughs> so your skin is not happy about this, right? These enzymes designed to break things down is what's causing the irritation you see with athlete's foot, with a yeast infection, with diaper rash. So it's the release, release of those enzymes that are causing the irritation that comes with um, that kind of infection. The other way they act as parasites, fortunately for humans, because of our defense systems and because of um, the great qualities of our skin, we really don't have to worry about fungi like literally bur like burying into our bodies. Uh, we do have to worry about those enzymes it secretes, but for the most part, it's not like literally growing through us. But in other organisms, particularly plants, and this is showing um, fruits and plant derivatives, where the fungi do bury their hyphae into the living organism. Molds are a great example. Molds are actually integrating with that uh, food item. So you think about bread, and we'll explore bread mold in a little bit. You have the slice of bread, but you literally have the hyphae and the fungi growing in that bread. It's excreting its enzymes. It's taking in the nutrients that it wants. And when you think about humans and our food crops, like we don't, we don't want. <laughs> fungi doing that, right? Like we don't want them to take out the nutrients in that food item because we want that. The other issue, and we're not gonna explore this too much, but the other issue is a lot of fungi release kind of these secondary toxins. Take the word toxins lightly. The toxins can actually be something that could make humans really sick. And some toxins are totally fine, like blue cheese. Blue cheese is a fungi. It releases a toxin, but is a toxin not harmful to humans. So like I said, use the word toxin kind of lightly. But a lot of our molds do harm humans. And so that's another impact that they have on us. Okay, but I do, I do want to leave it on a happy note. So we got like some good fungi things, some bad fungi things. Let's, let's end it with some more positive about fungi. So thinking about you and your everyday life, I mean, if you guys like mushrooms, um, like as a food item, 
Yay, fungi. Um, we also use yeast. So yeast is a fungi that we'll explore more in this class. We use yeast for making bread, for beer, and for wine, as well as some other food items. We also can thank different types of cheeses uh, to fungi, like the blue cheese I mentioned earlier. Things like so soy sauce and tofu um, are also um, creamy. They're fermented through using fungi in that fermentation process, sorry. Um, and then finally, antibiotics. Penicillin is kind of uh, the most famous one. Penicillin is actually one of those toxins released by fungi. But again, toxin in this case, I don't necessarily mean it in a bad way. It's just a secondary thing that is released by the fungi. For humans, we've learned, oh, like this secondary toxin or this secondary excre excretion material used to kill bacteria. Now, while we still use penicillin today, it's not the most widely used antibiotic, but still, I mean, this kind of paved the way for how we treated infections. So with that, we're gonna kind of end there, just giving you a little preview as to what fungi are, why we need them, what they're good for, not just for humans, but also for our ecosystem.